they all know. But in any case, I'm Matthew Francis. I am a freelance uh, science journalist. I write about physics, astronomy, math, and related fields. Um, I'll have some links at the end of the talk where where uh, you can look up some of the stuff that I've done. But uh, my background is in gravitational physics, cosmology, which is the study of the universe as a whole, and uh, especially the intersection between the two. But today is, I, I had something a little different in mind today. Um, for one thing, I think sometimes when we get involved with research or talking or, or classes or teaching or whatever, sometimes we lose sight of why we do what we do. And so today I would like to talk to you about black holes, but in a little different way maybe than, than we are used to talking about them. And so I talk, so my title is Gravity, a Love Story. And it's not the same kind of love story that maybe you know you, you've you've seen in other contexts. Um, it's it's a love story of the mind, but it's also a love story of sharing. Um, when you are when you are interested in a subject, when you care about um, a topic, the thing that you want to do is share it with other people. And so that's the the love story that I would like to talk about. So and of course obligatory Einstein quote um, is is the I want to make sure the slides are the should be the biggest thing up, right? I hope. Bigger than my face. Okay. So, because there's not a lot of text, but it'd be nice to be able to read it. Okay, so this is the, this is a quote. As, as with many Einstein quotes, there's about 50 versions of it, and but this one actually is based on a real quote, and this is a translation. This is something that Einstein jotted in the margin of a letter um, in German, and the translation. Um, is a little longer winded than the version you've probably heard. You've probably heard the version that says something like, you know, gravity isn't responsible for people falling in love. And uh, But Einstein said, falling in love is not at all the most stupid thing that people do, but gravitation cannot be held responsible for. Um, but gravity can be held responsible for you falling in love with physics in some cases. So let's start with not the first black hole that was ever found but the first black hole that was discovered, that was identified as such. This is Cygnus X1. The image on the left is visible light image, and the, the big star in the center is a bright blue star, um, and the other, all the other stars in the image have nothing to do with it. So it looks like it's a binary system, but the the uh, the other star that's right above it is actually closer to us than than the star associated with Cygnus X1. And in visible light, there is no black hole. It is not there. You cannot see it. It emits no light that we can see. But the image on the right in X-rays, that big blue star is gone. There is no uh, it doesn't. It doesn't emit any appreciable X-ray, any appreciable X-ray light that that we can detect. But there is another object, a hidden object, that is emitting a huge amount of X-ray light, and that X-ray light is what gives it the name. It's, it, it, there, we're often very creative in astronomy and naming things. So Cygnus X1 is the first X-ray source in the constellation of Cygnus. So such an exciting, evocative name, as, as we all know. Um, but this was found in, uh, found in the 1960s. And because it was found to be very small, okay, very compact, um, too small to be something like a neutron star, but it was also too massive to be a neutron star. Um, that indicated that this was actually a black hole. Well, at that point in, in time, nobody knew 
whether black holes actually existed or not. Black holes were one of those weird consequences of Einstein's theory of relativity, and people weren't people would debate. There, there were there were fierce debates at, in that era um, over whether black holes were just a mathematical extra, ab, abstraction. There we go. There's the there's the word, or whether it was something that w could actually be real. And we can see why black holes are not a uh, are, are are a very strange thing. Einstein himself did not believe black holes existed. He didn't think that was compatible with with the the universe as he saw it. Um, but something that I, I say a lot, and and uh, uh, so you you can uh, you, you'll see you'll see this if you if you read some of my essays, but something that I say a lot is that Einstein is the first authority on relativity, but he is not the last authority. In other words, just because Einstein thought something about his own theory doesn't mean what he thought was correct. Um, and so black holes are real, and Cygnus X1 was the first one that we identified as such. However, it wasn't the first black hole we knew. The first black hole we knew was actually discovered a lot earlier um, in radio light. Um, early radio telescopes picked up bright radio sources, including one, including uh, a galaxy that was spewing out gas in huge jets, and we'll see some examples of that. Um, now let's turn our attention to a black hole um, that's of a different type. Cygnus X1 is about, now I, gotta, now I can't remember how massive it is, I think it's about eight times the mass of the Sun. Um, so it's a, you know, it's fairly substantially sized object in terms of mass. But here is the black hole at the center of our galaxy, which is known as Sagittarius A star. And the image the, the uh, background image is the center of the galaxy in radiolite, and the inset is the motion of stars orbiting that black hole. Um, let's see, that's uh, seven of them. They've, since that image was, was published, they found two more stars that are in that immediate region, including one that is the closest star yet discovered to the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Okay, and this, is, this clocks in at about um, six million times the mass of the sun. Okay, this is known as the supermassive black hole. Now, if you look at those orbits, you can see that, well, they're elliptical, okay? we're going to be able to use Kepler's laws, which you, you may or may not have run across, to, to work backward. We can work backward plotting the, uh, the size and duration of these orbits and figure out how massive this black hole is. Okay, so this is a great example because for one thing it points out a very common misconception. Okay, first of all, it's we're on the internet, so we have to have a law cat. Um, actually, my own cat may make a guest appearance. I hope not, but we'll, we'll see. I have two cats running around here, and they tend to get in the way. So we want to ask the question, what is a black hole? First, though, it's often instructive to point out what a black hole is not. What is a black hole not? First, do black holes suck everything in? No. Black holes don't suck. Um, this is one of my big pet peeves. If you want to make if you want to make my beard bristle and steam come out of my ears, just say black holes suck. Or say you talk about black holes sucking matter in. No. Black holes do not. Another thing that I that I'd kind of like to to get out of our minds is is a little more abstract, which is the idea that uh, space. You, you you've you've seen this picture on the right. The you know, the the rubber sheet. You know you you think of 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 the space time 
as a rubber sheet, masses sink into it and things roll around. I hate that. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Okay, so you, you all are my friends, so do not use this analogy. And I'll show you why I think it's lousy as we go. So first of all, don't think about black holes as being some kind of bottomless pit. Okay, that's really not a very good way to think about them, and don't think about them sucking things in. The question we have to ask then is, what is a black hole if those two things aren't very good descriptions of them? Actually, this XKCD comic encapsulates my feelings about the rubber sheet analogy. Imagining is fun. But that's about as far as we want to go. You all read XKCD, right? If you don't, if you don't, why are you here? <laughs> okay, so a black hole is its event horizon. Okay, now that's a term you've probably heard. Um, let's see, I, I don't know if we can be interactive here. Can we be interactive? I just realized I'm kind of talking into the void. Can we be? Yeah. Okay. So what's an event horizon? Anybody want to anybody want to take a crack at that? It's the point at which the gravitational pull is so strong that the light can't escape. There we go. Okay, it has to do with how... Uh, it has to do with a particular point or rather a, a surface beyond which nothing can get out. Um, as you no doubt know, nothing can move, no thing can move faster than the speed of light. Okay? No object, and that includes, you know, any, everything we know. Nothing that includes can, everything we know about the atomic universe. The subatomic universe, the rules are still... Okay, like, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No. Okay. Um, no, no material particle can move faster than the speed of light. That, what about that, that error that happened with uh, the Hydron Collider over a year and a half ago, where we actually thought we actually found something that was a particle that moved faster than the speed of light? That was still those those <laughs> results are still being determined as we. No, see. no, no, no. That, that's that that's turned all out to be false. That. that turned out to be false. Exactly. Okay. So that that was that turned out to be a, a, an experimental error, okay. So so the point of the event horizon is that nothing can once it has once it has gone once something has passed that horizon it cannot return to the outside universe. Now. That, as far as we know, is a black hole because we cannot probe inside it. Okay, we cannot any. We could send a probe to a black hole. We could orbit around it. We could take measurements. But once it's past that event horizon, nothing, no message from that probe can ever come back to us. Okay, so that means, as far as I'm concerned, for the, at least for the purposes of this of this talk, we're not going to get inside there. The event horizon is the black hole. Okay, so here is, a, here is a diagram of a black hole. Okay, there's some really cool stuff going on. Now, first of all, this is, this is a realistic black hole. This is called a care black hole, K-E-R-R, -R, or rotating black hole. Okay, so this may be a little more complicated than, than some of the... Oh, Jeff, you're frozen. Okay, someone someone is muting me. <laughs> Tyler Webb was Tyler. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes. Yeah, so okay. So first of all, at the very center is a what's called the singularity. Now we don't know if the singularity is actually there or if something weird is going on. That's the regime of quantum gravity. Okay, that's an entirely different talk. So we'll leave that one aside. But the main thing is, in a rotating black hole, the singularity is a ring. But it's a weird ring. It's a ring with no thickness. Um, so uh, you could actually have trajectories that go through the ring. Um, 
all sorts of crazy stuff like that. But we don't know that for sure. We cannot actually measure it. The next thing is the event horizon. Okay, so the egg shape part, the black ovoid in the middle of this picture, that's the region surrounded by the event horizon. Okay, that's our point of no return. Once something crosses that, it cannot return to the outside universe. Then we have what's called the ergosphere. Has anybody heard, has anybody heard of the ergosphere before? Raise your hands if you have. <laughs> okay, we've got some people yes, some people no. Okay, the ergosphere is awesome because the ergosphere is a place where you cannot be at rest. And we'll see a way of thinking about the ergosphere you know, in a slightly different way. But if you, if you think about if you're on a, an escalator, okay, you're on an escalator, the, the stairs are moving, and if you're standing still, the stairs will carry you with them, right? Okay, that's the easiest way to go. Now, if you decide you're, you're, you decide to do what we've all been tempted to do, and maybe some of us have done it, you decide to walk down the up escalator, okay? You don't have to confess that. I've done it. <laughs> you don't have to confess it. If you walk fast enough, you can still walk down the up escalator. Even though it's carrying you up, you can walk fast enough. The ergosphere would be like if the escalator were moving faster than you can walk. So no matter how fast you are walking, it will still be carrying you up. That's the ergosphere. Okay? So nothing can be at rest there. And we will, as we will see very shortly, we have gotten observations very close to that ergosphere. Okay? Then we have the photon sphere. If you have a photon, okay, photons are, are particles, particles of light, which means they obey laws of gravity, okay? They don't have mass, but they obey laws of gravity. And so what happens is a photon can actually describe a circular orbit around a black hole at the radius of that photon sphere. Okay, so if you were somehow able to park your spaceship at that radius, you could conceivably see the back of your own head because light would pass around the black hole and come around to your eyes. Okay, so black holes are trippy places, no matter how you think of it. You don't have to talk about quantum gravity to get to the trippy stuff. Okay, so this is, this is the diagram of a black hole. Now, a lot of times we will talk about non-rotating black holes because the math is simpler, but realistic black holes do rotate. And in fact, um, the black holes at the centers of galaxies, hi, cat. You want to say hi to everyone? <laughs> I told you he might visit. I can't close the door to my study, so... Um, but... Uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, yes, black holes at the centers of galaxies are not only rotating, but they are rotating pretty close to the maximum rate that they can possibly rotate. Okay, so I expect you to all write down every equation that's on this slide. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Okay, I am showing you this because this is actually what you should never do when you're giving a talk. Do not put a bunch of equations onto a slide like this because you're going to be reading the equations and you're not going to be paying attention to a single word I'm saying. I could start reciting words to songs and, and you wouldn't be paying attention. So these are the equations, however, for a, an object with mass moving near a black hole. But don't worry about what it says. The main thing we're going to be interested in is thinking about what, that, what we would do if we were plotting that equation. Okay, so this is the energy, potential energy, near a black hole as a function of the distance from the black hole. And I've got three different things going on here. First is good old Isaac Newton's law of gravity. Okay, that's the solid black line. Okay, then we've got the dotted blue line is a non-rotating black hole. 
If you're, if you're moving near a non-rotating black hole, this is the potential energy that you would measure. And then finally, the dashed red line is what happens near a rotating black hole that is rotating at the maximum rate. Okay, that's the only one we're going to really be interested in. Okay, so here's the thing. If you know anything about, now you should, you should know by now, you're, are, you all, are you all physics students? Phys or physics-ish students? For the most part. Most, most, okay. So you probably have seen potential energy diagrams by now. Okay. So you think about it like a hill. Okay. The top of the hill is you know, unstable. If you, if you roll one way or the other, you're going to roll all the way down. The bottom of the hill is a stable place. Okay. So the bottom of this hill is a circular orbit. Okay, so in all three of these cases, in good old Newton, in, in a non-rotating black hole, and in a rotating black hole, you can have a circular orbit if you have enough rotational oomph. Okay, in the case of the sun, the planets were formed in orbit around the sun. They were all formed from a, a disk of matter when the, when the, ga when the uh, solar system formed. Okay. Black holes act in a similar way. If you've got two, if you've got a star orbiting around a black hole, okay, they probably formed as a binary system when they formed as stars, and then at some point, the star went supernova and left a black hole behind. Now, so the bottom of the hill you can see doesn't quite correspond to the same place in these three different. Uh, three different models. Okay, so you could actually tell the difference between a rotating black hole and a non-rotating black hole just by analyzing the orbits of objects around them. Okay, that's how we can tell that the black hole at the center of the galaxy is rotating. Although that tends to be less for the uh, the, the stars than for the gas, but the same principle still holds. Okay. The other thing is you notice that all three of those lines come together the farther away from a black hole you get. Okay. For the sun, the, there, the sun does not have an event horizon. Okay. The, uh, the sun um, is far too big compared to its mass to have an event horizon. And so we orbit a long way away from the sun. So we are not going to see much of a difference between the predictions of, of general relativity and the predictions of Newtonian physics. The potential energy is almost exactly the same. Now, there's one other thing I want to, to point out briefly, which is you notice at the top of this figure, I have a, a value labeled L. Okay. That is a measure of the angular momentum. That's a measure of the angular, the, the rotational speed of an orbiting object around. Okay, so keep that idea in mind for the next one. Okay, now we're going to crank that value up. So now it is orbiting faster. Okay, and notice if it's orbiting faster, we no longer see any difference between Bla the, uh, the, the Newtonian and uh, uh, general relativistic physics. Okay, that tells us we can have stable orbits around black holes. No sucking involved. Okay? However, that also tells you that if you have very little angular oomph, you're going to fall in, okay? So this is the case where L is too small, too little angular momentum. Now you're going to have a death spiral. You're going to have plunging in because you don't have enough rotational speed to keep going. Now here's where you get a big difference between uh, Newtonian physics and general relativity. In Newtonian physics, you've got something known as the centrifugal barrier. Do you run across that one? Anybody taking mechanics? Yep. <laughs> Say so centrifugal barrier. Yeah, that's that basically says that you will, you, you know, not, even if you're going pretty slowly, as long as you've got some angular speed, you're gonna you're gonna fall into orbit. 
you're never going to plunge to your death. Now, of course, if you're, if you're close enough to the sun, you'll still fall in just because the sun has physical size. Okay? Um, you have to remember that the sun, the sun's actual border is way beyond the right edge of this graph. Okay, the sun's event horizon radius, if, if you had this, a black hole the same mass as the sun, its event horizon would be about three kilometers uh, in radius. Okay, that's an easy, by the way, this is one of the easiest formulas in general relativity. You, you, you can memorize it easily. For every solar mass, for, for an object that is the mass of the sun, the event horizon radius is three kilometers. If it's twice the mass of the sun, it's six kilometers. If it's three times, it's nine kilometers. That's one of the easiest formulas. Even, even I can memorize it, and I can't memorize anything. Uh, so here we've got death plunges, in essence, because the bottom of the hill for the Schwarzschild, the, the non-rotating and the rotating black holes, are at the black hole itself. Okay, if you do not have enough angular oomph, you will fall in. And you will might as well say goodbye to everybody now because you'll never see them again. Okay, here's a here's a this this is a question that's has anybody seen the 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 movie for, I think it was from 1980 called The Black Hole? Yes. Disney. Yes. Terrible movie. Terrible movie. Uh, the black hole leads to hell and heaven. <laughs> okay, now here's. Here's a way I like to think about black holes that's a little more dynamic. So as you could see from those previous slides, it isn't enough to think about just how far away from the black hole you are. You also have to think about how fast you're moving well, in, in the rotational way. Um, so you you are always having to think in several dimensions. So instead of all of that kind of you know, rubber sheet and black holes are the, a bottomless well or something like that, I'd like to present another analogy. This is the river model. Okay, If you are on a river and you're just in a canoe, uh, pull up the paddle and the river will carry you along. That river is, the, the water is space-time and the current is gravity. You can paddle opposite to gravity. If gravity is relatively weak, then you can paddle fast enough that gravity will not pull you in. Okay. We don't really have to worry about the gravity of the sun for, for most things like you know, putting people in orbit on the International Space Station. Okay. Because the current from the sun is comparatively weak, okay? Well, we can ignore it for the most part. But the main thing is, Earth's gravity is not. So the river model is a way for us to think about, okay, you've got this current that's carrying you along. It's a dynamic view, not a static view, okay? So you can think about something like a black hole as being a place where the current flows to. And you don't have to, it, it's not a, a literal metaphor. I mean, it's, this is very much a metaphor. We don't have to think about the water as coming from someplace. We just have to worry about what it is doing at your location. So what you have is near a black hole, that current is exceptionally strong. Okay, It is going to carry you in unless you fight very hard against it. And then when you reach the black hole itself, no matter how fast you paddle, you will not escape the current. Okay. And actually there was a great story not too long ago, maybe you saw it, that, that people found that uh, there are certain uh, current vortexes in the Atlantic Ocean that are described by very similar mathematics to black holes. Not not a perfect not a perfect match, but it was it was pretty close to the point where there are places where you where where objects that go inside this vortex cannot um, uh, cannot get back out of the vortex. So here is something um, known as a phase diagram. 
Okay. Now, phase diagram. The phys physicists are silly. We have we use the term phase diagram for more than one thing. Um, but have you seen diagrams? Again, you, this may be from a mechanics class, where you plot the velocity versus the position. Have you done that? Yes. Yes. No. That's called. <laughs> they have, they might not remember, but they <laughs> Okay, so, fair enough. Our mechanics teacher. <laughs> Say, so that's that's really the that, that's really the question is how many times do you see it? Once you once you've taught it a dozen times, you'll remember it very well. But uh, for example, a spring, you know, simple harmonic oscillator, a mass on a spring. Um, if you plot its velocity versus its position, it'll trace a nice circle. Okay, in the phase diagram. Okay, now in this case, we're considering a the distance from the black hole is on the horizontal axis, and the speed it is moving around. Okay, so that's that angular speed we were talking about is on the vertical axis. Okay, so the event horizon is going to therefore be a vertical line. But let's plot currents. Or actually, first, let's plot an orbit. I forgot to put this in first. So here is, here is one of those death spirals. This is falling into a black hole. And by the way, this is non-rotating just because it's simpler. Okay. So you don't have enough angular oomph. Now let's plot the river. Okay. So you have some angular oomph, so you're not going to do a direct plunge in. You're going to do a spiral. But the red arrows are the current. That's the current of space-time. This is what I am trying to, would propose to you as a better metaphor than the rubber sheet. If you sit in your canoe, the red arrows are telling you which way the current will carry you. In this case, into the black hole. Bye-bye. <laughs> now let's give it a little more oomph. Okay, now this is cool. This is known as a precessing elliptical orbit. In fact, this is known as a space-filling curve, if you want to use the mathematical term. Okay, space-filling curves are really fun. If you've ever run across fractal geometry, um, fractals, um, fractal geometry a lot of times will talk about uh, space-filling curves, where where you know, the, the orbit will never completely repeat itself. It'll just keep going and going and going, and eventually you will have uh, you'll have lines filling up an entire uh, uh, kind of donut region around the black hole. Okay, so in fact, this is what we see in our own solar system to a lesser degree. Mercury uh, does not trace a perfect ellipse. It traces a non-repeating pattern. And that was one of the first confirmations of general relativity, was measuring how much uh, Mercury's orbit fails to repeat itself on each passage, the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. Okay. Now, black hole is correspondingly stronger gravity, so you're going to have a correspondingly larger effect from from something orbiting it. But let's look at the river for this. Okay, now you can see again that the the arrows are describing kind of a whirlpool, but now what we've got is a place where you can have stable orbits. Okay, there were no places where you could have stable orbits before, but now we've got two of them. That's the green diamond. Okay, you can see the green diamond is where the, the center of this path is. And by the way, remember the, the black hole is actually located at the left edge of this of this diagram. Okay. So the, the black hole is not located at the green diamond. That's just the place where the orbit is most stable. So what you're seeing here instead is the planet or star or whatever moving around the black hole, getting farther and closer in, speeding up and slowing down as it describes its orbit. Okay. That's the, what the current is telling you. Actually, the black point is something cool, too. That is a circular orbit 
a, an unstable circular orbit close into the event horizon. Okay, that's like if you balance a pen on its tip, you can you can balance it, but if you nudge it in just a slight way, it'll fall over. Okay, you can actually have a have a circular orbit close into the black hole, but uh, it's very hard to get something perfectly into that orbit, and the slightest disturbance will knock it right in. Well, that's all great, but what about some real black holes? How do we even know black holes exist? Well, we already got some hints of that from, uh, from the discussion of Cygnus X1 and the black hole at the center of the galaxy. But let me put it this way. Did you know that some of the brightest objects in the universe are black holes? Who knew that? Anybody know that? Some of the brightest objects in the whole universe are black holes. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's saying, all right. No. There we go, you've learned something. If, this, if, you don't think of it, if you don't learn anything else today, remember that one. Black holes are some of the brightest objects in the universe. This is the galaxy M87. This is a giant elliptical galaxy, one of the biggest galaxies we, we know of. This is huge, okay? And you can see that you can see this huge billowing jet of gas coming from the center of this galaxy. Okay, this is thousands of light years long. The center of that, the base of that jet, is at the very center of the galaxy where there is a black hole four billion times the mass of the sun. That's the biggest black hole we know of. Okay. Four billion, uh, let that sink in for a minute. No star can be that big, okay? There are even galaxies that are smaller than four billion times the mass of the sun. That is a black hole with the mass of a tiny galaxy. But, actually, the great thing about elliptical galaxies is they don't have much gas in them. They don't have much dust, Okay, so you can see pretty much straight through into the center of this galaxy, unlike the Milky Way where everything's kind of messy, kind of a traffic jam at the center. If you look straight into the center of this galaxy in radio light, you can actually see gas swirling around the black hole. Okay, well, see. We can, we can figure out how it's moving using the Doppler effect, okay? So last year, using high-resolution radio astronomy, um, astronomers figured out which direction the gas was moving around the black hole. And they figured out that it has to be moving in the same direction the black hole is rotating. Because it is so close that it could not be moving in the opposite direction of a rotation without being without moving faster than the speed of light. Okay, that's how close into the black hole we were getting. That's almost to that ergosphere I told you about, where nothing can be at rest. So it is swirling around at close to light speed. That's called an accretion disk. Okay, the gas inside that accretion disk heats up. And you know what happens when gas heats up? Expands. What does gas do when it heats up? Expands. Expands and gives off light. Okay? This is really hot stuff. So the kind of light you are seeing from a black hole is going to be ultraviolet or X-ray light. Okay? That is why we were able to see Cygnus X1, is because the gas orbiting around it was so hot. But another side effect of this gas swirling around is some of it gets channeled into the jets. And that, that jet is what we are seeing in M87. Now here's another one, NGC 1365. Um, has anybody taken astronomy in this room? 
astronomy. Yeah, okay, quite a few. Okay, so you you know if you if you've done this, you you've you've noticed that astronomers give such clever and creative names to galaxies. Um, yes. This is a particularly pretty galaxy, um, a barred spiral because it has it has this part in the center where the stars form a, a lane. Uh, the gas and dust form a lane through the center. But the very center of that, um, the inset shows the, the same galaxy in X-ray light. There's a very intense X-ray source, which is, again, the supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy. And they measured the speed that that gas was moving is almost the speed of light. Okay? That's an indication that the black hole is orbit is is rotating at its maximal rate. Actually, even the Milky Way's black hole is probably moving is probably rotating pretty close to as fast as it can, because um, and th this unfortunately I don't have a good visual for. Um, most of the, the the gas falling onto the the Milky Way's black hole is getting spit back out. I described it in an article I wrote as being like Cookie Monster. You know how Cookie Monster you know, takes his cookies and, he goes, and the cookie goes flying everywhere. Does he actually swallow any of it? Well, that's our, that's our Milky Way's black hole. Most, you know, the black hole's going, rum, 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 and, and the, the, all the matter is flying back out. Okay? That's a sign that the black hole is rotating as fast as it possibly can. If you, if the, that's sort of a black hole's built-in defense mechanism. If it is rotating close to its maximum speed and something tries to fall into it, if it were spinning any faster, it would tear itself apart. So rather than accept new matter into it, it spits it back out. Okay? That's pretty wild. The fact that we can figure that stuff out, even though we cannot see the black hole itself, we can get in close enough to be able to tell how much matter it's rejecting. So the Milky Way's black hole spits out about 99% of the matter falling onto it. Far from uh, eating everything that comes near. Now, I've been studying black holes sort of off and on for, for several years. It's, it's not my primary area of interest. But I would say with a lot of us, some, something that, that uh, my, my fellow science writers and, and scientists have, have taken to doing recently is we've been talking about where did our love of science come from? Um, when did it when did it spark for us? When did we when did we first start thinking? You know, this science stuff is pretty pretty awesome. You know, it's like, uh, gee, science, you're you're special. Would you go out with me? Check yes or no. Um, this when when did when did that kind of hit for us? And of course, for a lot of us, it was very young. Um, I would say that probably many of us, it was you know when we were three or four and first learned about dinosaurs, we started thinking that maybe science was pretty awesome. Um, and, and I was that way too. You know, dinosaurs were probably the first thing that really started me thinking, oh, maybe I should be a scientist, and then realized that paleontology is mostly crawling around on your hands and knees with a, a brush uh, trying to find, you know, a bit of a hadrosaur jawbone or something like that. Um, but these were books that I that I came across when I was fairly young. The one on the right is a picture book, um, a, a a rather marvelous picture book um, that I that uh, uh, has a bit of everything. I, I got it from the library when I was young because it had lots of pictures of Jupiter, which was my favorite planet. Um, <laughs> And that was, uh, you know, it was you know, that was. I, the, I, the, this is this is my generation was the generation of the Voyager spacecraft. And when you are when you are a, of a young age and you're seeing the first high resolution photographs of other worlds, these moons orbiting around Jupiter, details of Jupiter's clouds. Um, 
that's really striking stuff. We're, you know, we're, we're still getting that kind of stuff from Saturn, but this was the, from the Cassini probe. But this was really kind of the, the first thing for us, um, these pictures of Jupiter. And so our universe had all that, but it also had some stuff about black holes, and that was the first time I'd ever heard about something like a black hole. Um, and then when I was a little older, my, my dad had checked out the book on the left, A Frozen Star by George Greenstein. Um, and I read it because I was that kind of kid. I read every book I could get my hands on. But that was really when I first started thinking, maybe there's something to this black hole stuff. This was in the 1980s when black holes were first starting to be f widely accepted in astronomy but hadn't been universally accepted as being real. And of course in the years after, the decades after, I would say no sane astronomer doubts the existence of black holes anymore. We know that almost every galaxy has a black hole at its heart. So here are some grown-up uh, grown uh, books about um, uh, black holes and relativity. The one on the left is a book for general audiences written by an astronomer at Columbia. Um, and this is about mostly about black holes at the centers of galaxies. But there's a lot of context in it, like what do, what do black holes have to do with star formation in galaxies? Answer, a lot. If there are black, ho black holes at the centers of galaxies, can actually throttle star formation or boost it. Okay, that's a big deal. Black holes can shape the environment far from their, far from their event horizons. And then the book on the right, if you want to learn about general relativity, that's your book. Okay? Start there. Other books later will fill in all the, the, the higher level math. This book will tell you all the physics that you need to know. I have a PhD. I've done a research articles on general relativity. This book is the one I always go back to uh, because it's the book that has the clearest physical understanding. Sorry to interrupt, but if you could um, start wrapping it up, and I'm, I'm wrapping. Just... Uh, this is it. I'll this just is the make last it slide. Sure. <laughs> this is the last slide. So, I guess the if you if you think about so often when we are in the middle of a project, when we're in the middle of classes, when we're and and this this is both from the student side and from the teacher side, we sometimes forget. The reason why we study this stuff is because it's friggin' cool. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay? We don't study black holes because you know, it, it we don't study black holes because we have to. Okay? We study black holes because we want to. There's no black hole in our neighborhood. Thankfully. Okay? <laughs> We're not, you know, this is this is not something that is, you know, th this is not something that has any immediate practical application. Although, you know, general relativity is necessary for stuff like GPS systems, but we study black holes because our universe is a beautiful place. Black holes are beautiful things because they are what tell us exactly how far gravity can go. Your gravity is ubiquitous. You know, gravity was the first force of nature that we that we first started understanding from a scientific point of view. Black holes are the end of that. They're the consequence of that. They tell us how the universe is, why the universe looks the way it does. This is the love that we have to remember sometimes when we're in the middle of homework sets, when we're in the middle of grading homework sets, when there's a deadline for an article coming up and we cannot stand it. We have to remember sometimes. We do this stuff because it is awesome. Woo! So I'll take questions. Um, so if anybody has any questions, um, 
I don't know if Hendrix has any questions. If you can't use the microphone, Hendrix, you can um, chat, which I see right here. Um, they exited, so <laughs> <laughs> no questions. Um, does anybody have a question? Uh, I don't have a question, but I want to say uh, it might make your uh, 